official hello to everyone that's watching. And uh, my name is uh, Joe Viviano. You can see it right there on the screen. I've been with Progressive for you know quite some time now. And Yasin and um, Gabby are here as well uh, from the company. So if anyone has any questions at all, just please place them in the chat. If you have any questions for me uh, as we're going through this, if something you know um, pops into your mind, a question that you want to ask, just place it in the chat. And then when we're done, I'll just start through the uh, questions and I'll answer, try to answer each and every one. But also, if you have any questions about uh, progressive dentist, progressive orthodontics in general, um, the company itself, the costs involved, the seminars, things like that. I'm going to cover that towards the end just a little bit uh, briefly, but you can also place in the chat the questions to both Gabby and Yassine, and they'll, you know, get back to you, um, you know, during this webinar and even afterwards. Okay. So let me um, give it to Gabby just for a second, because I know you wanted to say a few things before we started. Yes, thanks, Dr. Viviano. Um, so like Dr. Viviano said, my name is Gabby and you can see it there on the, um, on my little screen. Uh, I have my cell phone in there. If you guys want to uh, ask me questions via text, you can also send me a chat uh, through Zoom. Um, if you can all please add your first and last name, uh, that helps us uh, take attendance. And later on, if you don't get your CEs, then we know that you attended. Um, if it says iPhone, we have no idea who you are and we won't be able to give you any CEs. Um, also at the, at the end of the webinar, I will add a link in the chat the, with a form. You will fill out that form in order to get your um, CEs um, emailed directly to you. Um, and if you don't know how to change your name, you could just send me a chat with your full name and I'll change it for you. And, and again, I'm here to answer any questions regarding um, the series, whether uh, traditional ortho or aligners. Um, so feel free to ask me about anything. Thanks. Yasin, would you like to, did you have anything that you'd like to say? Nothing more than what Gabby said, but I'm also here as well if anybody has any questions. And I would like to welcome everybody and uh, enjoy the webinar. Okay. All right. Well, you know, we do, I do um, these uh, short webinars periodically. And most of the time, these intro webinars are designed to just kind of introduce people to, you know, the prospect of uh, adding ortho to their offices. Um, how you could go about it, what the costs are involved, maybe what the materials and the armamentarium are involved, uh, how the process would work for you, how long it would take, all of those different things. So you can get a good idea of how it might fit into your you know, own office. But Yasin and I were talking um, about this, this little specific one, individual one right here, and then maybe changing it up just a little bit. So instead of doing all of those things, which I'll, I'll touch on those things, especially toward the end, uh, we decided to just kind of give you a little, you know, introduction to a couple of, well, actually four uh, cases, you know, non-extraction case, uh, a growth case, uh, not necessarily a mixed dentition case, although it, it was started in mixed dentition, an extraction case, um, an impacted canine case, um, and, I'll take you through the, um, the PowerPoints, which are, for lack of a better term, kind of dumbed down with a lot less and a lot fewer slides, and just kind of touch on the highlights of these, um, of this mechanics and this orthodontics that once you, you, you start down that road and you go uh, and you begin to study with, let's say, you know, a company like Progressive, it really does take the mystery, you know, out of orthodontics. I know that you know most of us when we were in school, you we really weren't introduced to ortho much, and it, it really kind of is a mystery to most you know GPs because they really didn't really study it that much in school. But I will say this before beginning, and that is, you know, we have been doing. I've been doing this for, for quite some time, and I've seen this time and time and time again. Really, adding orthodontics to your office, adding full comprehensive ortho, and that is both straight wire mechanics and aligners, because if you know one, you know, you're gonna be able to do the other and vice versa, pretty much. Um, 
it really is the most productive thing that we can do as a GP by far. Um, you know, we're all doing everything else right now. We're all doing as much as we can do as far as restorative and all the other, you know, different things. But adding orthodontics, you know, to your office is really by far the most productive thing that we can do. And really in this latest, you know, economic environment that we find ourselves in, and even maybe hopefully not, but, you know, next year, everybody's talking about a recession for the next year or so. We might find ourselves in a position where, you know, maybe some of us, you know, really do need these extra procedures and these extra, this extra production in our office. And ortho by far is, you know, the, the most productive. So as I'm going through these cases, um, I'll stay kind of at a kind of a low level as far as that that's concerned. I won't get into a lot of details, but I'll kind of touch on a lot of different things that you would see if you were doing ortho in your office. Um, how POS maybe approaches it, how it might you know integrate into the software because I do have a lot of uh, slides that show screenshots of you know the small screen software that you know we and Progressive use you know to help us diagnose and treatment plan. And once again, if you have any questions, please just put them in the chat and I'm gonna stay around as long as it takes um, after this thing is over. So whatever number of questions we have um, is just a okay with me. And let's, without further ado, let's get going. So the first case that I have for you is uh, a 27 year old. And these, these slides that you see here, these types of slides where this slide here says complete treatment, line mechanics and finishing, when you are studying, you know, orthodontics through progressive, you're going to see hundreds and hundreds of different cases. And the cases are going to be presented in, in PowerPoint form. And they're going to be very, very detailed as far as starting the case, uh, the mechanics of the case, finishing the case, and all the little nuances that um, are in between. So these types of slides that I'm going to be showing you right here are the same type of slides that you'll be seeing um, when you are um, studying the cases. So this gal is 27 years old with a chief complaint of crowded teeth. And in orthodontics, the one of the first things that's taught um, through progressive is standard of care. So as a GP, if we're going to be doing orthodontics, we're held to the standard of care of the of the orthodontists. And we need to keep to that standard of care. So there are certain types of records that we take that must be taken to maintain that standard. So these facial photos that you see here, the side view, the view with the, it's supposed to be a social smile. She doesn't look like she's, she's actually smiling you know, that big. And then a facial um, in the anterior posterior with the lips closed. So we're looking for all kinds of different things with this. We're looking for symmetry versus asymmetry. We're looking for, is the are the upper teeth um, in the midline of the face? We're looking to see if the patient has a very protrusive profile or maybe retrusive profile. We're looking for a lot of things facially, not necessarily dentally, but facially. And these are the three photos that are that we will always require someone take, you know, when you are doing your initial records. So when you're looking at her, everything looks pretty normal, you know, as far as the face is concerned, upper midline to face is, is in the center. But when you look at her lateral view, the one that's on the left, you can see that her lower lip is a little bit protrusive, her upper lip, or it could be her upper lip is a little bit back. But other than that, everything looks pretty normal. So remember, her she comes to the clinic and her chief complaint are crowded teeth, right? So then we ask her to, you know, open up and start looking at her teeth. And we find that, you know, this is her bite. So most, you know, GPs, when a patient like this, you know, presents to the office, it would be, you know, absolutely, you know, no way. This is something that, uh, you know, immediately gets a, a referral to the orthodontist. You know, I'm not even going to even, you know, attempt to even talk to the patient about this. But in reality, as we're going through this case, you'll see that the, the underlying position of these teeth, the the position of the teeth looks bad, obviously with the anterior crossbite and the scissor bite, but the basic position of the teeth is not that bad. In ortho, um, like I was saying, the standard of care 
is basically what you're seeing right here as far as the records are concerned. So this is just a screenshot from the um, small screen software. And with every case that you would start, this is what you would do. You would take the facial photos. You would take these six intraoral photos like you see. You would take either a scan or a photo of a lateral view of a model. Normally today, most of us has, have scanners. So you would take the SDL file from your scanner and just import it into small screen via this lateral view. This one down below is called the double occlusal, and you'll see um, in just a minute, you know, what we do with that. The standard of care obviously is a pano and a SEP. And then for teaching purposes, when you're going through these cases, um, and this is this would be one of your first cases that you studied in POS if you um, if you joined. They, we would even give you um, a cephalometric that's already traced with all the points and structures and everything in there so that you can compare and contrast and use it kind of as a learning you know, tool. And then way down here in the lower right-hand corner, this is called a frontal sap. These are not unnecessarily taken, but because of these cases being teaching cases, you will find that the, the records are pretty comprehensive and often the, um, they're done, there's, there's extra records that are taken that might not you know, necessarily be taken. So this um, is a page, a screenshot right out of the small screen software that you would import into small screen and then uh, do the uh, analysis. So you guys have seen this. Um, this can be a photo, all right, of the, of the models if you have them, but most of us now are doing screenshots. What we're looking for right here obviously is classification. Uh, you can see, you know, cross bites. You can see um, anterior-posterior relationships. We're looking mostly for the class. You know, is this a class one, two, or three, you know, type case? Okay. Um, the double occlusal, we take both the photos of the double occlusal and um, the double occlusal scan. This just happens to be very, very simple. If you have um, any type of stone model, whether it's white stone, yellow stone, any stone, you can take alginate impressions and pour them up and simply put them on a, a flatbed scanner and um, use the black and white scale. And you'll get um, the picture that you see on the bottom. And you'll see in just a second what we do with this and why it's important. But we have both of these things so that we can compare and contrast. Okay. So this is another screenshot from small stream. The reason why we take the double occlusal and the reason why it's important to us is because it gives us a lot, of, a lot of information. So everything that you see on the screen is pretty busy, um, but what you're looking at right now is our ability to look at a patient's well, look at a patient's um, occlusal scan, figure out how large the teeth are, figure out figure out um, what relationship the teeth are. Are they twisted to the meso? Are they twisted to the distal? The blue line that looks like a wire um, that's around the outside of the arch form. That's a wire shape. The wire shapes that you use in orthodontics are important because the teeth are going to eventually correspond to that wire shape. And in this particular case, you can clearly see because of that anterior crossbite, the lower arch is very, very tapered compared to the upper arch. The upper arch is much more, we say square versus the lower arch that is tapered. At the end of the day, in order to get this um, occlusion fixed and get that anterior crossbite fixed, these these um, these models, well, the the uh, coordination of the upper and lower arches has to be perfect. That's really the only way that the teeth are going to come together. So by doing this double occlusal scan, um, we can get all of this information. These lines that you see right here are for symmetry. One of the hardest case types to actually uh, diagnose and treat in all of ortho is an asymmetry case. When you have class two on the right, maybe class three on the left, and there's nothing that you know, has symmetry. The upper and the lower midlines don't correspond to one another. The right side is different from the left side. The top is different from the bottom. And you have all these asymmetries in the, the bite. That in orthodontics is the hardest case to treat. So what this double occlusal scan does for us and what SmallStream will help you do is analyze that whole uh, scheme and it will give you much better information on what you're dealing with and obviously, you know, kind of how to fix it. Standard of care is the panel. 
Um, you can't start an orthodontic case without a pano. We're looking for a lot of different things with the pano. We're looking for all the pathologies that might be there. We're looking for the, the root position. We're looking for supernumeraries. We're looking for uh, sinus height. We're looking for how low the sinuses go between usually the posterior teeth. The sinuses are lined with cortical bone. Cortical bone is harder and more dense than normal bone. Moving a tooth in a, and around cortical plate is more difficult and slower process. This just happens to be a, um, uh, a screenshot that doesn't show the condyles, but in orthodontics, um, we, and when you're taking your pano, we, ab we absolutely do want to see at least the physical form of the condyle and fossa, not necessarily the re relationship, but the physical form and make sure that there's no path pathology there. Um, so panos, um, not just a, a start panel, but a finish, you know, a final uh, panel and even progress panels during the case to check for the possibility of root resorption are important. Obviously, we have, you know, the cephalometric analysis. So Smile Screen, the software, will do all the analysis for you as long as you place kind of a series of points and structures, you know, on the, the um, ceph. And then basically you just press one button and it gives you all the data. This is just a, a very, very short list of the data that it you know, gives you. And what it will also do is if there is something that is not correct, well, let's see, not correct. If there's something that's a little bit abnormal in the SAP analysis, what it will do is it will highlight it for you. And once again, it just gives you that little flashing red light so that when you're trying to uh, diagnose a case, especially in the beginning when you're a little bit uh, a novice at it, it it's, it's a great help um, as far as the, um, the diagnos diagnosis is concerned. So this is just a, a, a sample of the, the lateral CEP numbers that it will um, give you. And you notice that uh, it gives you a whole list of skeletal numbers and, and has nothing to do with the teeth. It has everything to do with just where the bones of the face are. And then it has all of the dental and facial numbers, and that's that is showing you where the teeth are. Okay. Every case in orthodontics, and you will be taught, you would be taught this. Every case in orthodontics, when you are uh, considering the options, you must list all the possible options. It's standard of care. What that tells the that what that tells anyone that let's say goes you know goes back and let's say um, critiques the case is that all of the options that were that were available to the patient were presented. So obviously non-extraction treatment is always going to be the first one. We're always going to explore the possibility of non-extraction treatment, and only when we the all of the data shows that we can't possibly do it non-extraction, then we begin to consider extraction. So in a case like you saw here, case 1010, there is a possibility of an extraction diagnosis. And since it's a mild class three case, you know, it would be upper second bicuspid, we say fives, and lower first bicuspid. And then, you know, way off kind of in the distance, there is the possibility of surgery. It is, you know, it is a class three with a, in a it's mild class three with an anterior crossbite. Really, I would say nobody would do surgery on this case. And if you did, it would be excessive, excessive. However, it is an option. So in ortho, we always must consider all the, the options. So when you do all of this analysis, when you gather all this data, you start putting it all together, you're gonna to come up with a series of treatment options. You're gonna select one of them, obviously. So we call that in ortho, we call it the treatment decision. And in this case, it was a non-extraction treatment decision. So that's what you're gonna see. You're just gonna see how the case um, treated from start to finish. One of the, the nice things about the software, uh, Smile Screen, is that all of the possible treatment plans for all of the different malocclusions are already pre-written for you. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Every time a patient, a different patient comes in with a different malocclusion, there are 150 pre-written treatment plans in small screen. And you know, it's not really a cut and paste type thing, but 
the treatment plans are there. They're, they're written very, very well. They're very, very detailed. They give you treatment sequence. They give you everything. And then you can edit them specifically for your individual patient, right? So every time a patient comes in, it's really a no brainer. Once you decide on the treatment, you, you have it. It's just right there. You just basically cut and paste it to your patient file. So the treatment decision for this gal was non-extraction. So that's what we're gonna see. So these slides, um, the way that they work, you know, and the, when what you would, you would see um, often is, um, at the top of the slide, uh, you know, you'll have, hey, what did we do this, you know, this time? Um, how much time between visits were there? Or how much time between adjustments? What wires we used? Um, and, and details on what, you know, what you see. And so for this specific patient, what we're seeing right now is it's an initial, what we call the initial band and bond, which means that this is the first time that we are placing the brackets. This um, these brackets just happen to be porcelain in the upper and middle and the lower, which is, is quite common for um, uh, adult straight wire mechanics because the, the porcelain brackets are more aesthetic. But you have your choice. You could do all porcelain. Most of the time you can do all porcelain or you can do all metal. You know, it's up to you and it's up to the patient. The porcelain brackets are a little bit more expensive, so that might be a consideration. The wire that's used here is a very, very special wire. It's called an 012 nitide. So it's a very thin, uh, um, the width of it is very thin, and the N stands for nickel titanium. The nickel titanium or the nitide wires are the types of wires that literally I could take in my hand and fold into a little ball, and then they would spring back to their original form. So what this does is it allows you to place an initial wire into the arch form, and then just sit back and watch that wire do all the work because the wire wants to go back to its original shape. So you can see that these brackets look like they're just placed willy nilly all over the place. That's absolutely 1000% not the case. Each one of these brackets is placed on each individual tooth in a very specific position. The technique um, in ortho, it's called straight wire, which means that you place the brackets on a tooth, you get the brackets into the correct position on that tooth, and then you run a series of straight wires through the arch with the, with the wires becoming increasingly, increasingly um, more stronger, let's say, with more force. And because the brackets are pre-angulated and pre-torqued, and they're individually designed for each and every tooth, the case will automatically begin to align for you. The wire does all the work. The only thing that the brackets are there for is to hold the wire in place. And uh, the bracket slot does, the, the torque that's in the bracket slot is important, but basically it's the wire that's doing all the work. So what you see here is an initial band and bond, and it looks like, you know, kind of a wet noodle, you know, type wire that's going everywhere. But as you'll see, the, and, you know, as the, the wire just springs back to its original form, um, the teeth will magically align, automatically align. So we're, we're going to start with a very light wire. Another reason that we start with these light wires, especially in adults, is because adult teeth are not used to moving. If you get a 10-year-old in, in your office and you put um, a wire in place, the teeth will move rather quickly. If you put a 60 year old in, you know, in the chair and you put brackets on, the 60 year old's teeth are not going to move nearly as fast, at least in the beginning. Those osteoclasts and osteoblasts, cementoblasts, cementoclasts, they're not there. They need to be manufactured, you know, in your liver and your spleen and your bone marrow before they, the teeth can actually move. So it's important in the beginning, especially with an adult case, to not put too much force on the teeth. And by using these really light wires, that's what we do. We put a very light force just to get the teeth to begin to move. And then once they start to move, then we can increase the force and they'll move faster. So when you're looking at the occlusal view, even especially this, this upper side, the one that's on the right, you can see that the wire, it just goes in and out and in and out. And we say that it's tied in because in the beginning of an ortho case, when you have this extreme of um, tooth malposition, 
what you're going to do is you're going to use steel ligature ties. You're not going to use rubber bands. So you notice on the slide, there's a little steel ligature, we call it ligature tie around each and every tube. If you tried to use an elastomeric, the little, let's say colored elastics that the kids you know, love, um, they would pull out of the slots and it would take, I mean, literally it would take twice to three times as long to, to straighten these teeth. If you had a child, let's say a youngster, an adolescent that came in that had this type of malocclusion, you would still use steel ligature ties and then you would put the colored elastics over the top so that they could leave with, let's say whatever, you know, whatever colors they wanted. These little blue things that are in the back, those are separators. That's a, a little elastomeric. What it's doing is it's separating the, the molars there so that you can eventually place um, either a bracket or a band on those upper molars. In this case, the, in this case, the molars are out of the second molars are out of alignment as well. So you're going to want to eventually, you don't have to do it all in the beginning, but you're going to want to eventually bracket or band every single tooth. We do use many, 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 many molar band, uh, excuse me, brackets. You do not have to use molar bands unless you have something attached or welded, you know, to, that needs to be attached or welded to the band. So at the top of the screen, what you'll see is it will say adjustment. So in, in ortho right now, um, you do not see a patient on a monthly basis. That's, that's a big no-no. Um, if you see a patient on a monthly basis, you are seeing the patient much too often. It's another nice thing about modern ortho, and that is the, the amount of appointments that each individual patient takes is a lot less now than it used to be. If you, if you backtrack, let's say, you know, 20 years, it was automatic. The patient came in every month and it took two to three years to finish the ortho. Now the patients are coming in about every two maybe even two plus months. And the, the standard treatment, the regular you know, treatment for most cases, regardless of whether it's in a non-extraction or extraction, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 18 months, maybe at the outside 24 months. So the time that people are spending in braces now um, is a lot less because of these, these really nice, um, say fancy wires, but um, modern wire progression that we have now which you just saw the first one is going to be uh, an 012, all right? So you, what you'll see as you're going through these, some of these cases is you'll see um, the word adjustment. And an adjustment means, hey, it could be six weeks between this visit. It could be eight weeks between the visit. It could be four weeks. Um, but it's, it's when the patient was back in the chair and uh, they had something, you know, let's say done. So at her first adjustment, it's, it's kind of difficult to see the tooth movement, but there is a little bit, even in her at the adjustment number one, which is only a month, she had some fairly decent movement. And then over the next three or four months, you're gonna see a lot of very, very significant movement because what we're gonna do is we're gonna eventually, okay, eventually change that wire. So here's adjustment number two, five weeks later, the term that you see up there in the upper left, retie, what that means in ortho is everything stays the same. The wire stays in place, nothing is taken out. The only thing that you do, okay, is you, you check to see if these ligature ties are still very tight because we want them to be tight and we want that wire to be uh, completely um, locked into that slot. And if one or two of these things are, are beginning to loosen up just a little bit, and that's uncommon that they do that, um, what you would do is you would take it off and you would simply put another one on and you would make sure that that one is, is tight. So this is exactly the same wire. There's been no change in that. And all those little steel ligature ties there um, are still tight. So for this visit, this adjustment number two at five weeks, in my office, since you know I basically know kind of, kind of the future of a lot of these cases, I would only appoint this person for about 10 minutes. And the person would sit in the chair, you would say hi, goodbye, you know, look at the teeth, make sure that the, the ligature ties are, are nice and tight and they're gone. So the amount of time that we're spending on these patients is also a lot less. Another thing to consider is when, when you're first learning ortho, you're a little bit tentative because you don't see the future. You've never done ortho before. 
most of you, you don't see the future. You don't, you don't, you know, you can't from your memory look and see, okay, I know that this person's teeth are going to move this fast. And in six months, they're going to look, you know, different. So it's a little bit disconcerting in the beginning. Well, you can get around that because the first three to four to five to six months of any ortho treatment is what we call level and align. And what you're doing is you're doing just exactly what you're seeing right now. You just have to sit there for an appointment to make sure that the brackets are on correctly. And then literally you can get up and your assistant can place the wire and tie in the wire and give the patient instructions and hygiene and do whatever. And you're already off, you know, in another operatory doing something else. Um, so in the beginning, we, we would want you to start cases early. So if you, let's say you decided to, you know, join progressive, what we would want you to do is start cases early. And the reason why, for two reasons, number one, it's the learning process. And number two, you get a return in your investment earlier than you normally would if you waited in you know, any length of time. But the main reason is all you really need to, all we really need to do is teach you the exact position of these brackets in the teeth. You place them on the teeth tie a wire in, and then you sit back and twiddle your thumbs and just watch the alignment phase. You're really not doing, doing much. And you'll see in almost all of these cases during the alignment phase, there's really nothing to do. You place the brackets on and then you just watch the wire do the work. So this is adjustment two. Clearly the teeth are starting to move. If you remember this lower right canine was well lingually placed and now it's starting you know, to come out. The upper arch is gonna be a little bit behind the lower arch. The reason why is because this patient really still does bite into that anterior crossbite. So the lower arch doesn't have um, any, anything stopping it from just aligning nicely, whereas the upper arch um, still has to cross over that crossbite. So the upper arch will be a little bit behind. That's pretty normal. In, in ortho, um, at the end of the day, we want the, all the roots to be parallel. And you can see clearly right now that the lower canine roots are not. So this is an indication that you would need to um, reposition the bracket. The bracket was in a, a little bit diff, uh, incorrect position. It didn't align the roots very well as all the other teeth are aligning. You wouldn't want to finish the case like this. You would want to uh, make sure that those roots are parallel. So this would be an indication where you would just simply take that bracket off, clean it up, clean the surface of the tooth, and uh, rebond it right back on. Okay. Adjustment three. Now this has been ten weeks. Okay, so what uh, the clinic has done here is just said, okay, we're just going to you know let you go home and let the wire do all of the work. We're going to do nothing. And we're just going to watch it. So this was a ten week interval. This is only adjustment number three. And now you can really clearly see that the teeth are beginning to, you know, finally, you know, gain an arch shake. And to this point here, the only time that you've really spent in this case is the initial, you know, band and bracket. That's about it. Okay, so let me go back here, just one. Now, you can see that the arches are beginning to align. The wire is beginning to straighten. It wasn't this flat in the beginning. It was kind of up and down and up and down and up and down. So it's beginning to flatten. And therefore, what you're seeing is you're starting to see the bite opening a little bit. In addition, you see these little blebs of composite. They're, they're basically tooth colored composite here. Those are called bite turbos. A bite turbo, and there's a lot of different types of bite turbos. This is just one, you know, one style. A bite turbo is a is a um, a bite opening device. In this case, it's just some composite that's placed in the, the occlusal surface, and it opens the bite so that any crossbite, whether in the anterior or the posterior, is more easily corrected because you don't have the interference every time the patient bites down. So those are called bite turbos. Now they do interfere with the occlusion. There's no question about that. So what you do with bite turbos, if you put them on is you go ahead and you correct that crossbite as fast as you can once the teeth begin to move, and then you simply remove the bite turbos. Because the bite turbos will cause, and in this case they do cause, some um, intrusion of these teeth where the turbos were you know, placed um, for the longest time. 
adjustment four. You've only seen this patient four times. Each time you've seen this patient, it might have taken you a few minutes to place the, the composite, the bike turbos. But other than that, in these four adjustments, you've probably only spent, you know, maybe five to 10 minutes in the operatory because really you're just watching the teeth align. The wire has stayed the same and the wire is now um, aligning the teeth for you. Okay, the next wire that you would normally go to mm -hmm, is um, a very, very special wire. Let me fast forward here. And this wire is called a, a nickel titanium, heat activated nickel titanium wire. So what this wire is famous for is when you first, when it is at room temperature or body temperature, it has a certain tensile strength. But when you, um, when you cool it, you can literally um, fold it into a ball and um, when you chill it, let's say, and you would chill it with um, a Q-tip with some endo ice, you'd rub it on the wire. When you chill it, you could literally fold it into a little ball. And then when it goes back in the patient's mouth, it goes back to its original um, shape. The reason why that's important is because it, it is a much stiffer wire and it's also rectangular. The, the initial wire was round. This wire is rectangular. So this wire is going to be doing a lot of different stuff. And this wire is also going to be in the mouth for a long period of time where you're just not doing anything at all. So this is called an 1825 NITI or an 1825 heat NITI, HM. And its claim to fame is that it's heat activated. So if you have a tooth that's really out of alignment, and it would be very difficult to fit this wire into that slot. If you cool that section of the wire, you can, it, it becomes super passive. And you can, we, even with your finger, you can just push it into the slot and then tie it in. And then as soon as it begins to warm up, as soon as the lip touches it or the tongue touches it, um, it goes back to its original tensile strength. But you've already tied it in. You've already used its, its uh, heat activation to help you. So as far as wire progression goes, the next wire that you would use in the standard wire progression is this one. So to, to this date, there's been five adjustments. It's probably been about seven months or so. Um, you've, this is only the second wire that you used in, in this case. And as you can see from, let's say, the occlusal view, the teeth are really now beginning to align. The bike turbos have helped the, the anterior teeth, the upper anterior teeth move forward. And now you, you're almost seeing an, an edge to edge situation, whereas before you had a, a complete scissor bite in the anterior. Now what you're seeing um, on this slide for the first time is you can see this ligature tie lacing, this wire lacing right here. And you can see that there's a little bit of a space between um, the lateral incisor and the canine. There was no space to begin, and th that arch form was very, very crowded. And now all of a sudden, only after using two wires and six adjustments, which are minor, you're actually now seeing space being formed. The reason why you're doing that is because the arches are developing, and it's kind of like a flower opening. You know, the arches will develop like this, and as they do, the teeth advance, but also the teeth torque because you have a rectangular wire and a rectangular slot. And the teeth are, are torquing into their, their final, or moving towards their final torqued position. And what this does sometimes, not all the time, what this does is in a um, uh, very crowded case, you close your eyes or you know, you're not paying any attention and you come in and the patient actually has space between some of their teeth. So adjustment number six, and we're just kind of watching this, you know, this, this progression um, as the teeth align, and this is only the second wire, lower canines look look better. They're not perfect yet. They're looking better. Progress pound to check for that root uh, alignment. Um, cool and retie, okay, that's an appointment that you have this thermal wire in there. So you would cool it wherever you needed to, and then you would retie it wherever you needed to. Mostly you don't have to do, you have to, you don't have to do that. If you do a good job tying it in in the, the very first time you place it, retying it is um, not really a thing that you you know kind of need to do. 
So once again, we're just basically watching these teeth align, only the second wire. So on the lower, remember we had that space here between, I said between the lateral and the canine, that's between the two laterals here, the central and the lateral. This is a, an example of chain. Chain is used in, um, in ortho to close um, little minor spaces. Chain is not used to close um, extraction spaces. That's closed with a, you know, different mechanics. You could have maybe put the chain on the top. There's a little bit of space here to close, but um, they chose to, in this example, they chose to put the chain on the bottom. This just happens to be an example of what we call power chain. There's different types of chain in ortho. Um, some are strong, some are weak, and they're used for different things. And obviously, as you're going through the course, you know, you learn, you know, the indications for these things. By adjustment eight, you know, if you if you just glanced at the arch forms, you can almost now, you know, say that if you had a cast of each one of those, they would, you know, just fit, you know, together without any problem. So the arch forms are looking really, really good. So we call this, okay, in ortho, I know there's a lot of terms and I'm, I'm trying not to, you know, give you too many of those, but we call this in ortho, uh, the alignment stage. So what has happened, okay, what has happened is you have taken um, an arch that started like these, this picture on the left, the lower and the upper. And what you've done is you've placed two wires, one very thin um, night tie wire, and then the, um, for several, several, several months, and then the nickel titanium heat activated wire for the next several, several months, until you got to the point where all of the rotations are gone, right? It looks like this upper left five is still a little bit you know, rotated, but for the most part, at the end of the alignment stage, that's when all the rotations are gone. So for this lady that started with this anterior crossbite and this much crowding, it took you about eight visits with two arch wires per arch. And there was a lot of crowding, including the fact that you had to spend a couple of months with the bite turbos. So this whole process took about a year. So far, okay, so far there has been zero mechanics. We don't call what we did here mechanics. All you've done is place the brackets and, and put some wires in. And to be, you know, to be honest, to be honest about it, um, in many orthodontics, orthodontists' office, the assistants have done all this work, including place the brackets. In some orthodontist office, the assistants will place the brackets, and all the orthodontist has to do is walk by, look at the bracket placement, make sure that he uh, thinks that the brackets are placed correctly, and then gives the thumbs up, the okay to go ahead and. Um, bond the brackets. And then the assistants put the wire in, the assistants, you know, do the ligature ties, the assistants do the cool and reties. The, an orthodontist, if this were in an orthodontist office, um, probably didn't do anything but initially place those brackets and then get up and walk away. And even in some orthodontist office, the assistants do it. So this kind of doubles back to, you know, the question that I run into and some of the other instructors run into a lot. And that is sometimes people think that for whatever reason, um, since ortho is such a mystery in, in dental school, that you can't do it. And that's completely, completely incorrect. Because if you just think about it for a second, if anybody's had ortho themselves, or if anybody's had their kids go through ortho, you know how, how it works. The orthodontist walks around with his hands in his pockets mostly and just tells his highly trained assistants what to do. And the assistants do most of the ortho. So the fact is all you have to do, you know, as a practicing GP is just learn, learn the topic, you know, spend some time, learn the topic, and you, you can be um, basically just as good as them. And um, you don't have to go through all the extra stuff of going to ortho school. You don't have to teach. You don't have to present a, you know, a paper. You don't have to do a lot of lab work. All you need to do is learn how to move teeth. All right. So once you get past the, 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 the alignment stage, okay, now you can go to a different type of wire. It's called a stainless steel 1925. And now the mechanics start.
So it's been a year that you've basically just been watching this case. And now that the teeth are, are basically aligned, now you can start the mechanics. So what you're looking at right here is called class three elastics. This is a certain strength of elastic that goes from an upper molar to a lower uh, loop on the arch wire. It's called a keyhole loop. And this rubber band in a class three case, this is class three occlusion, is a four ounce rubber band. So whenever you have a class three case and you're wearing class three elastics, they're gonna be a four ounce rubber band and they're gonna go from the upper molar to the lower keel. It's pretty standard. So it doesn't matter if you've got a 10 year old class three or an 80 year old class three. Basically, you're gonna be doing exactly the same thing, right? This is a different type of elastic. This is called an anterior cross. The reason why this elastic is, is here in place is because if you look the month before, this is the month before, this is adjustment nine. Do you see the upper and lower midlines are not consistent? So what you wanna do is you wanna skew those midlines a little bit so that they're consistent. And you would want her upper teeth to, to go slightly to the to her left and her lower teeth to go slightly you know, to her right and straighten the midlines. So you wear an anterior cross and the next thing you know, you have your midlines that are more consistent. Right. This is called a class two. This was a class three, opposite direction. This is a class two. This is a six ounce elastic. The anterior cross is a four ounce. There's probably only, maybe six or seven different, you know, types of um, elastics, class twos, class threes, verticals, you know, which you'll see. So now we're, we're, we're entering this, um, what we call mechanics phase. So now what we're trying to do is we're trying to get that nice class one occlusion. And you can see on the right-hand side, it's already lined up. Remember there was a scissor bite, this, this lateral incisor and then the canine, we're, we're in scissor bite. Now look at it, it's been 11 adjustments, and you really haven't done much. And it's almost perfect occlusion on the right. The left side's a little bit different story because these two bicuspids have those bite turbos. And literally what happened with the bite turbos is they in, it intruded those teeth. So now you have a little bit of an open bite there, which obviously needs to be fixed um, as the, the case goes on. When you finished with your mechanics, okay? You go to the last phase of ortho, which we call um, finishing. Finishing is a different wire. You go out of the big, heavy wire that you're used for mechanics, and you go back to a round stainless steel wire, or sometimes you go to um, your 1825. It depends. And this last phase of ortho is when the teeth are generally in good position. And all you're trying to do is align and make you know, little minor changes here and there so that the bite is really, really nice and tight. Often in case finishing, when we get to this, this last stage of the case, we use what's called vertical elastics. So these elastics right here, and they're two different um, styles. One that's on the right is a little triangular vertical, and the one that's on the left is a little inverted V. The one that's on, on the uh, right side, the patient right here is less strength than the one that's on the um, left side. They're both the same rubber band. They're both a three ounce um, elastic, but this one is gonna give you more strength to close the bite. And obviously when you're wearing vertical elastics, you know, that will bring the teeth together and um, close this little, you know, discrepancy that you have here. You really don't have a discrepancy on the right-hand side. So this vertical elastic is just there to keep everything nice and tight. Whereas the vertical elastics on the left-hand side is actually a stronger one, and it's designed to help close the bite. Okay. Now, in, in ortho, what we try to avoid, if we can, and there's, there are ways around it, is a lot of wire bending. Because wire bending um, takes a certain amount of time and energy and skill you know, to develop. Um, but you are taught how to do wire bending. We try to keep it to a minimum by repositioning brackets. But what happens with wire bending is you have to actually take a straight wire, an 018 straight wire, and you see that there's a little, there's little bends in the wire here. This one is very, very obvious. The wire's here, then it bends down, it goes across and bends back up. Well, what that's gonna do is it's gonna take this tooth and move it down. So if you need to close an open bite, and in this case on the lateral side, you would make wire bends, which would help close the bite. And in conjunction with 
the, the vertical elastics, you can get those teeth together. So it's called case finishing, and this is wire bending for case finishing. A typical first order band looks something like this. Um, the tooth would be right in the middle, and this would move the tooth up, of course. The, the length of this, this arm right here depends, could be a quarter millimeter, could be half, could be one. Uh, it depends on how far you need to move the tooth. And these first order bends that you see right here can actually be made with um, what we call an intraoral finishing plier. Very, very simple. You don't even have to take the wire out of the patient's mouth. You just simply grab the, the plier and put it um, anterior to the, to the tooth and posterior to the tooth and make these bends using one little squeeze of the wire, of the plier. And it's very, very quick. So we do try to keep wire bending to a minimum and we teach you how to do that. But if you do, these first order bends can be made with an intraoral finishing plier and uh, they can be made very, very quickly. So now we're just in a finishing phase. And to be honest with you, this case would be done. This case would be done except for the fact that she needed to wear those bite turbos for about four or five months in order to help um, uh, correct the anterior crossbite. If it wasn't for the fact that those bite turbos interfered with the, the occlusion on these two lower bicuspids, this case would be complete. In case finishing for this specific case, that's where all the, the, um, the activity is, right here to get those teeth together. And um, in this case, it took, you know, repositioning a few brackets and making some wire bands and doing some verticals. It took about three or four months, you know, to do that. And you can see that, the, you know, slowly as she's wearing her verticals and as the, uh, the teeth are, the wires being bent, the teeth are coming together. Right, until you're done. So when you're finishing with an ortho case, right, you, take final records, you'll take a final panel, you take a final set, you'll take final photos, take a final occlusal scan, and you put them in the patient's chart as you know, their final records. So you have start records, you have some progress records along the way, and then you have final records. So this is her final occlusion, so let's critique it. Um, looking at the midlines, the midlines are good. If you look at the patient's right side, it's basically perfect. Perfect class one, very tight occlusion, nice. You look at the patient's left side, good occlusion, um, a little tiny you know, bite opening right here that nobody was gonna really notice. Um, maybe you could have spent a little extra time taking this lower second bicuspid and moving it up and closing this little gap. But without this little tiny you know, oh, issue right here, um, all good stuff. Final pictures. Start and finish, um, kind of clearly see what, kind of what happened. When she started, because of the anterior crossbite, the lower teeth were pushed forward, the upper teeth were, were back, and that, they were in scissor bite. So you had a very square upper and a very tapered lower. Because the arch wires, upper and lower, are coordinated arch wires, they're basically the, basically this, this, the same shape. They're a little bit different size. The upper is a little bit um, wider because you do have buckle over deck. But now you can see just by that wire progression and moving through the wires, what it did is it coordinated the arches and you, you ended up with, um, you know, a nice, you know, finish. So for teaching purposes, right? And it's really, really, really very, very good for teaching purposes. We have these things called overlays. So what you're looking at right here is basically just a drawing of the start set that's always in blue and the final, which is always in red. So this picture that you see on the left-hand side, you notice that it doesn't have any teeth. It just shows the maxilla, it shows the mandible, it shows the facial profile, shows the occlusal plane. And this overlay is at the SN line. This is your, this is your pituitary gland, cella, and this is nasion. So these two sets are overlaid on top of one another. That's the, this is the reference point. And what it's doing is it's showing the changes that took place from start to finish. So in this case, just you know, as an example, 
she had that anterior crossbite. So her upper teeth were, were retro to her lower teeth. So her lower lip started way out in front and her upper lip started in back. But by correcting that anterior crossbite, her, you didn't do anything with her lower lip. In fact, her, her, her lower teeth probably re retracted just a little bit, but you moved out her upper lip because you took that anterior crossbite and moved it forward. So she has a, a much better profile. So just the lip, the changes in the lip posture um, are really, really nice. So then what you're looking at on the right-hand side for overlays, one is called the maxillary, the lower is the mandibular. Now the teeth are in play. So what you're seeing is what actually happened in the tooth movement within the maxillary bone. And you can, you can clearly see what happened with the upper incisor. It started in the blue. That's, that's just taken directly from your start set. That's where that tooth started. And at the end of the day, it went forward two millimeters and down two millimeters, and that's where it finished. And that's what you're seeing, the difference between these teeth and these teeth right there. So this is just um, especially good for teaching purposes in terms of showing you just what happened with the teeth and also what happened with um, the, the bones. Now, if this were a growing patient, which we're gonna you know, touch on in a, in a minute or so, you're gonna see that the uh, skeletal overlay is gonna change drastically because the patient is growing. This patient was 27 years old. This patient's not growing. So there's very few bony changes, but with the kids, you'll see the, the drastic changes, okay? So the Seth started like this anterior, um, the, the final Seth shows the uh, much better uh, upper and lower position. There's your start, there's your finish. Okay, so what did you do to, what did you do to get to that point? Well, you put the brackets on, you went for the first year, all you did is place two wires or your assistants place two wires and watch the teeth align. Somewhere in that mix, you placed a couple little blobs of composite for bite turbos. You corrected the anterior crossbite um, shortly after a year. Then you went to your mechanics, series of rubber bands fixed the class three and the overbite. And then you went to your finishing wire, made a few wire bends, which you probably wouldn't have had to made hardly any if it wasn't for the bite turbos and you're finished. So orthodontists love cases like this. They love cases like this because this, the regular GP looks at a case like this and immediately just grabs his pen and refers it to the orthodontist. The orthodontist sees this patient and he knows that his assistants are gonna do 95% of the treatment in a case like this because it was basically just an alignment case. Because the teeth, they didn't look good in the beginning, but they were in decent position and all you needed to do is align them. So just kind of keep that in mind when, you know, when it comes time to, when you're looking at cases, um, you, you don't know what you don't know. And that's kind of where, you know, progress, somebody like progressive comes in. And, you know, once you, you know, take that first step, you start looking at these cases and you start saying, oh, okay, well, this one isn't that bad. And you look at, you know, a mixed addition case and you go, okay, well, that one's not that bad. And before you know it, you think back on all of these cases that you referred to the orthodontist were not that bad, which you, with a little bit of knowledge, you know, you could have done yourself. Okay, so here's a slide um, on, I, I know in this case, I was kind of introducing that, that concept of wire progression, but this is basically how, you know, how it goes in, in modern ortho. So we, we call the, the, the visits adjustments. They're not scheduled monthly. So if you're doing the standard wire progression, you know, in general, you're gonna put that first wire in and it's gonna stay in for you know, two months or so, maybe more, depending on how much crowding you have. You're gonna put the heat activated wire in, that's gonna stay in for somewhere between three and six months, you know, depending. You're gonna to go to your mechanics wire, you're gonna uh, do, probably do mechanics for anywhere from six to eight months. But if it's a very simple case, non-extraction case, you might be in your mechanics wire for one month, maybe two, so it depends. And then you're going to go to your finish, which you're going to double back to your 1825, or 
If you do have to bend some wire, you're going to use an O and E. So it's, that's kind of up in the air. So in 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 an 18 month case, let's say a year and a half case, which is very standard nowadays, you're probably seeing the patient nine to ten times. You're probably seeing them only nine to ten times in the 18 month case. And hopefully, hopefully your um, assistants are doing most of that work for you and we will we would show you um, how to train your assistants so that they can help you the best pos also offers assistant training courses if you wish to send your your assistants so that you know they're trained as basically trained as you know an ortho uh, assistant for you Second case, so let's go down in age. You know, the, this little girl is 11 um, years old. Her chief complaint, always chief complaint, in orthodontics, if you do not solve the patient's chief complaint, no matter, no matter if it's legitimate or not, it's a loser. You have to find out what the patient wants, what their complaint is, if any, and you have to either fix it or you have to tell them why you can't fix it, okay? So on these, on these cases, you'll always, you'll, that will always be there on um, each and every case in the chief complaint. Okay, okay so she's 11 years old, um, lives far away, is gonna have long appointment intervals. So we have a little girl, a little 11 year old girl, same old, same old, facial photos, what do we see? Very straight face, upper midline's the same, um, no gingival display, a little bit of, um, uh, asymmetry to the chin, right? Her, her chin, this menton button is a little bit to the patient's right, a little bit. Okay, could be a functional shift. All right, so we look at her teeth. So remember, her chief complaint was um, protrusion. Okay, so we're looking at her teeth, we're looking at the right side. <clears throat> well, the canines are basically class one, decent, you know, occlusal pattern. Left side's completely different. Left side, we say this is four millimeters class two. So right side is okay, left side is not. Why is that? The midlines are consistent, but yet we're class one on one side and, and a little bit of class two on the other side. This is an example of mild asymmetry. So this is a harder case type. Remember I said that, that asymmetries are, can be a little bit harder. So now it's our job to figure out why the, the case presents like this. Right? So same type of records, double occlusal, um, facial photos, lateral views, model measuring, where are the teeth, how are they rotated, where's the upper midline to face, how large are they, which wire are we going to choose. The, the software um, helps us do all of this and choose all of this. Right? Pano, the same. Supernumerary teeth, impacted teeth. Do they have all their teeth? This, you know, this little girl has all her third molars. Pathology, all of that stuff. Standard of care. Um, can you move? Right? We treat mixed dentition a lot, correct? And we, in fact, we like to treat mixed dentition. Can you move teeth before their apex is fully formed? Yes or no? Absolutely, yes. We move teeth all of the time when their apex is not fully formed. It makes absolutely no difference at all. So we could put a bracket on every single one of these teeth, the sevens, well, the sevens aren't erupted yet, but we could put a bracket on the fives, no problem at all, not gonna cause any, 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 any issues at all. Okay, so we do that. Luckily for us, that is A-OK -okay because we like to treat the phase one cases, the kids, because when you treat the, when you start earlier and you can get things solved in the mixed dentition, it makes phase, what we call phase two or the banding bracketing of every tooth very, very easy. Almost, almost exclusively non-extraction and mostly just an alignment case. And you're really in and out of the case in about a year, sometimes even less. Okay. Ceph, right? You're going to do the cephalometrics. Okay. So what she's probably seen right here is she's she's complaining of protrusion. Well, what she's really complaining about is overtech. 
And the overjet, right, is there because she's got the class two on the left. We'll get all the numbers, right? Small screen will give us all these numbers. All these numbers will eventually mean something to you. When they're highlighted in the different colors, that means that there is something a little bit abnormal about that number. It's either the tooth is too upright or too forward or too high or too low. But it's um, there's something a little bit abnormal. When we, when we are treating the kids, we are treating a person that is growing. So we have a way of, of determining where they are in their growth phase. So we, we, there's, a, there's a couple of different ways to do it. There's the, the easy way, which is the CVM analysis. And then there's the, a little bit harder way, which is the wrist film. So it's very, very simple. And you'd be taught, you, know, you would be taught this you know, as soon as you started treating you know, mixed dentition tissue cases. If you take a screenshot of the, their cervical vertebra directly from their, their CEP analysis. So this, this screenshot right here, this picture is taken directly from their CEP. Right? So this one right here, this is C2, this is C3, this is C4. And all we're doing with a CVM analysis is we're looking at the shape of the vertebra. And over here on the right-hand side, as you, as you get, as you're very young, when you're very young, let's say, the cervical vertebra are very, very short. The bottoms of them are very flat and the top is very curved. They're a trapezoid. And as you age and you get older and older and older and older until you're fully grown, skeletally fully grown, your, your cervical vertebra eventually end up with what we call a rectangular vertical with very, very deep um, curvatures on the, the base. So the significance of this is the patients aren't really growing a lot when they're in the CVM uh, one and two. They're growing their fastest. We say that the growth velocity is their fastest when they're in this stage right here. So if their vertebra look like this, that's when they're growing at their fastest rate. And then they start to slow down, obviously, as they finish their growth. So anytime you're trying to utilize growth to help you, typically in a, let's say a class two case, you want to time the growth, or excuse me, time the, um, the ortho at the peak of their growth. So this is the standard growth curve that you, know, you can open up any ortho textbook and see. And basically what you're looking at is these little numbers underneath one, two, three, four, and five correspond to CVM one, two, three, four, and five. So the, when are they growing their fastest, right? The vertical, um, Part of the graph over here is velocity in centimeters per year. When is a girl growing their fastest? CVM3, usually they're between 11 and a half and 12 and a half years old. And that's when it's the best time to use a growth um, management device of any type. It's a her it could be a Herbst, it could be a Jasper, it could be a power scope, it could be a Mara, it could be headgear, it could be any growth type appliance. You're gonna wanna use it at that spot. That's the best spot. We know boys eventually grow faster. Their velocity is faster. They'll, they'll really grow taller in a shorter amount of time. But guess what? They do not really do it uh, until they're good to be 13 and a half, 14 and a half. So we kind of have a problem with the boys in the respect that we're typically done with their ortho by the time they even start to grow their fastest. And that can be an issue sometimes, right? So this is the standard growth curve. That's what the CVM analysis looks like. That's the growth curve. When you, you know, when we begin to study mixed dentition cases, that's what we're going to study. Okay. Oh my goodness gracious. Yassine, I knew it was going to take longer. <laughs> okay, guys, I'm going to speed this up a little bit. Okay. Looks like we're all still here. Yes. I'm going to speed this up just a little bit. Okay. Same thing, treatment decision. In this case, it was non-extraction, right? So same thing. You, you, I think you guys are kind of beginning to get um, the, the drift here. When you start a case, it's the same thing. It doesn't matter. You put the brackets on in the, the correct position and you put these light wires in and you sit back and you twiddle your thumbs and you watch these cases just magically align on their own, okay? You do not do much for the first three to six months of these cases. 
Only when you get to the end of the alignment stage do you, you know, you go to your thicker wire and you begin your mechanics. This case right here is a little bit different in that it's a growth management case. It's a youngster, 11 years old. Girls grow fastest between 11 and a half and 12 and a half. So they decided to use good old fashioned headgear. Now headgear has gotten a bad rap over the years, but headgear um, done correctly is very, very effective. We use what's called cervical headgear. It's super easy to, um, for the kids to wear. Um, it's easy to adjust and they only wear it at night when they sleep. If you can get to them to wear it a little bit more, let's say throughout the afternoon, great, but they're only wearing it you know, at night. So what headgear will do is you would think that it would pull back the upper teeth and actually distalize the upper arch. It does not. What it does is it holds the upper arch in position and as the child is growing, now remember it's a growth case, as the child is growing, if the upper arch stays in start position, the lower arch um, will be allowed to grow um, and you indirectly correct your class two. And you'll see that in this case. Now remember it started a, a quite a bit of class two um, on the um, left-hand side with a little bit of functional shift. Same thing, we check for bracket position. We make sure that the um, uh, roots are all aligned. We eventually get into our, remember that slide I just gave you about wire progression. We eventually get into our 1825 upper and lower. That begins to add torque. That really you know, puts, um, you know, turbocharges the alignment phase. And now you can see she is literally, she's class one on the left. She's class one here. She started four millimeters of class two. And all you did during this phase is two wires, place the brackets, place two wires, and fit a hit. That's it. Okay. So now, right, it's just a matter of watching. She's not biting correctly on this one over here on the, on the left. Her bite is much better than that. Okay. We get to our mechanics. Now we have... Most of the time, we have a looped arch wire. Once again, this is a class two um, elastic. It's a six ounce elastic. It's generic in the industry. Um, it goes from lower molar to the upper keyhole loop. It's going to correct, guess what? Her protrusion, her overjet. Once the class two is corrected and she gets and her bite is a class one, she will not have that overjet and she will not feel like she's protruding. All right, class two elastics. All right, now well, I'm introduced a little bit different thing, and, and, I'll, and I'll touch on this a little bit more in the, in the next case. This is called a nickel titanium um, spring. In the old days, you know, if you started to do ortho, let's say 20 years ago, if you wanted to close extraction space or if you wanted to close any spaces, the patient had to be very cooperative and wear rubber bands. Modern technique does not use rubber bands intra arch. In other words, in the same arch. We use coils and these nickel titanium coils are um, stretched to a certain force to do a certain job. And they're very, very easy you know, to place. And the patient doesn't, have, let's say that you, you, you have a, uh, an extraction case where you, you needed to extract four by customers. Well, you have four spaces to close. In the old days, we used to make, um, we used to need to have the patient very, very cooperative and put, put, place rubber bands, change them two and three times a day in all four quadrants. So sometimes you're using 16 rubber bands a day. Well, now with the coils, we just place the coils, the coils do all the work, the patient doesn't have to do anything. So we often say that it's, it's kind of a non-cooperative um, treatment plan because the patient doesn't have to do much. And it makes it really, really easy. So from the start, you could see that she has the overjet. She was complaining of the protrusion. What she was really saying is I didn't like the overjet. So by correcting the class two, simply by aligning the teeth and wearing a little bit of uh, headgear, now she doesn't have the overjet. This is an example on the left where you have a growing patient. So they, she started right, start where the blue is. Her maxilla was here, her mandible was here. And at adjustment number 15, I'm not sure how many months that was, she had grown down and forward by eight millimeters. And the teeth had moved in this way, okay? Um, so there's different, there's different types of overlays. This is called a, a DHG overlay, no worries. It's a growing patient, 
she started in CVM2. Two years later, she's CVM5. She's not growing anymore on the graph. She started here. Now she's here. Right. A little class two elastics to just you know tighten up the, the, the bike because she complained of overjet. We don't want you know any excessive overjet. All right. Nice arch form. Okay. Now, the only thing I would say here, she looks really nice, right? Everything is good. Um, this would be, right, the time for a little bit of a cosmetic gingivectomy on the upper right lateral incisor to make it look more like the upper left. Yet another, yet another add-on procedure that goes along with ortho. Okay. And I'm going to show you that in just a second. So you started like this, 11-year-old mixed, I would say mixed dentition, basically permanent dentition but a growing patient and you finish, this is a, a, a four month recall. Um, so she's been wearing her retainers for four months. You finished here, what did you do? You aligned the case, you went through four different wires, your assistants did most of the work and you added headgear. You didn't see very many um, uh, wire bends for case finishing in this case. The previous case you did have some, you spent some time, but this case you did not. Okay, so a growth, a growing case where it's it's really really simple. Okay, this is going to be an extraction case, and I will um, touch on just let's say the highlights because this is a little bit different. I chose this one because it's got a couple of different things going on. This is even a younger patient. Okay. Their chief complaint was overjet and protrusion. This is significant for this case. They're, this little girl at nine years old, her chief complaint was overjet and protrusion. Okay, who's talking? Mom. A nine year old is not going to come into the, to the, the clinic and say, hey, by the way, doc, um, my chief complaint is overjet and protrusion. Mom wants her to be less protrusive. Okay, so you look at her. Clearly, you can see convexity here, right, in her lips. So there's a line that we use from the nose to the chin. It's called the E-plane, and the lips are in front of that. So yeah, she's con convex. Problem here is that she has no crowding and basically straight teeth. So you have this little girl that walks in the clinic. You would not normally, you know, say, hey, we need to do an ortho workup on you because you're too protrusive and um, Procline, let's say, but she says she is, All right? So you do your analysis. She's only nine years old. So now she's definitely mixed dentition. So the way that we approach these mixed dentition cases like this is once again, we, we look for the CVM analysis, and but we also look at the eruption pattern. So the very last tooth to erupt into the arch is gonna be your lower second bicuspids. Sometimes the upper canines, but mostly the lower second bicuspids. The way that you that you look at um, a case as far as the eruption pattern is concerned is when the a lower second by the crown is the only thing that's formed. There's still almost four years until all the teeth come in. If there's a quarter of the root, it's three. If there's half a root, it's two. And if the if the root of this five were three quarters formed, then she would only have about one year until eruption. This is kind of nice um, because if moms or dads even ask, um, hey, when are they going to get all the permanent teeth? If you have a panel, you can basically tell them within literally a few months. So for her, finally, when you look at her Seth, now you see the protrusion. You don't necessarily see it when you first walk in and look at her face or her teeth. But when you do the Seth, now you can see. So yes, she sees it, now you can see it. These numbers, remember on the SEP, the numbers that are highlighted are gonna give you a little bit of a flashing red light that there's something going on here. So yes, she is protrusive. So you do the same thing, right? CVM growth analysis, you, you put her on the growth curve. Every growing patient gets one of those, okay? Now, introduce you know, another thing that, that you will find very, very, very helpful. What SmileStream will do for you is it will give you what's called a VTO. 
VTOs are called visual treatment objectives. And what it will do is it will tell you where the teeth are going to end up based on your treatment plan. So this is what we call the non-extraction VTO. It's taken, the small stream will do all the work. It'll take it from the SAP and it'll use your model, model, model measure. It'll put the two together and it'll give you a picture of what's gonna happen to the teeth if you treated this case non-extraction. Well, obviously she had almost zero crowding. So the teeth are not gonna move. So that's why you see the blue, which is the starting position and the red or the orange, which is the final position, almost exactly the same because she had no crowding. Now, if you were to take out for bicuspids, if you were to extract upper and lower pores, obviously you have to close the space so the teeth are gonna retract. In this case, what's your chief complaint? Protrusion. What do you have to do to solve her chief complaint? You gotta extract teeth. So it was decided for this case, and this is a very interesting case because there was no crowding, it was decided to go ahead and um, extract fours. But, let me fast forward, but she's still in the mixed dentition. So this would be what is called a serial extraction case. We've all heard that, you know, maybe you remember studying it in school. So what you're gonna do is you're going to watch until these fours, all of the fours are almost ready to uh, pop into the arch, and then you're gonna extract them, okay? Small stream has a complete mixed dentition treatment protocol, complete. So it will take you from A to Z in almost in any mixed dentition case. It will give you um, the ability to classify it. What is wrong? What do I need to do for it? How long is it going to take? And what are the appliances for it? There's a, there's a module in small stream that will, that will do all of this for you as long as you take the initial records you know, and you know, put it in. So for this case, what we're doing, what they're doing is we're just waiting. So at a, they called it adjustment number one, but basically it's just six months later when they came in and you can see that the teeth are erupting. You can see that the, the root formation of the fives is a little bit um, better. Three months later, um, even more teeth are erupting and primary teeth are exfoliating. And finally, three months after that, they decide to extract the force. So the, the, um, the E's are still in, which is fine. Right. She's, if because of growth, she's even more protrusive now. You see how her lips are, are open at rest? That's not good. That's called incompetent lips. We do not like that. So since this was an extraction case, right? Extract the fours. Now what we're gonna do is we're, we're gonna let these anterior teeth drift because there's no first bicuspids. So the, these anterior teeth, you can see that they're, they're starting to drift backwards already. This little bar right here is called the TPA. What that does is it stabilizes the, the first upper first molars in position so that they don't drift forward. Those are the teeth that you don't want to you know, drift forward. So what I wanna do is fast forward here to the mechanics so that you guys can see that. So the same thing when you start the case, initial band and bond, Pretty aggressive to start with an 1825. That's not normal, but she's a kid. Right. Same thing. You just keep going through your wire progression until the teeth are aligned. You eventually get to, you know, you just watch and watch and watch and twiddle your thumbs. You're not doing anything until you get to your 1925. That's your mechanics wire. Okay. Now you can start closing the extraction space. So remember, uh, I mentioned in a previous case, these coils um, are nickel titanium coils. They're titrated to certain forces. It's very, very simple. There's a little ruler that you put you know, into the arch form and you're gonna pull this spring. You're gonna actually pull the spring until it gets to a certain force, Graham's force, and that's gonna close the extraction space. In my office, okay, I don't do any of this. My assistants do all of this stuff. I place the brackets, they change the wires, they tie it in, they change the rubber band, they put the coils on, they do all this stuff. You don't have to do any of this stuff. This is very, very easy. Your assistants can do it. It's just a matter of training your assistants, you know, to do it. And it's not that hard. So obviously what these coils will do month after month after month is they'll close that extraction space. And as the space closes, there's, a, there's wire that's going to start to poke out the distal end, which you have to clip. 
but you know, kind of month after month, the extraction space closes at about one millimeter per month. So if you have a full eight millimeter um, bicuspid extraction space, it takes about eight months to close. Right? At some point, the the you know the the extraction spaces are closed, and maybe there's a little class two or class three there. So you would wear some rubber bands. Right? And eventually you get to your finishing. So all spaces are closed, you know, decent overbite over overjet, um, minus four by cuspids, and now you're starting to finish. So the uh, this is a picture of the intraoral finishing flyer that you that you can use. You don't even have to take the wire out of the patient's mouth to make those up and down bends. Um, this one, they felt like that she could use a cosmetic gingivectomy. Her teeth were rather short, and I agree. So they did a gingivectomy. Now her teeth are much better. You, she's still healing, but you can tell that the teeth are going to be much, much more aesthetic. Start versus final models, you can clearly see, especially on this lower model, the, the difference in the protrusion. Now, the top model is minus the bicuspid, so the, you can tell that the arch form is much less protrusive. She looks great. She really grew. She really, really, really grew. In fact, she was a, what we call a vertical grower. Okay, way better lip posture. She was correct. When she walked into the clinic at nine years old like this, and she left like this, she looks much better. Okay, and look how much she grew. 18 millimeters down and forward. So you would, as you would expect, the upper and lower, you know, teeth, the incisors and the molars have come together, right? You extracted four bicuspids. So the lower, the upper and lower teeth retruded two millimeters in the upper and a full seven on the lower, you know, to get to that point right there. So she looks great. Now she's CVM5, she's done growing, she's way down here, you're good to go. I put this slide at the end of this one for this reason. This um, is just a list of all of the extra things that go along with ortho when you begin to do ortho. And I can send you this, as, by the way, I didn't say this in the beginning, but if you need any of these power, you know, if you, you need any of these PDF files or anything like this that you see, just, you know, email me, email Gabby, and I can get this stuff to you. Not a problem. But there are a lot of things that you don't know are going to be added into the mix once you begin doing ortho. And this is just a, a short list. Okay. All right. Let me take you really fast through the very last one and just show you yet another thing that you're, we're missing that let's say most GPs are missing the boat on when it comes to ortho and that's impacted teeth. And also what I want to do is I want to introduce the, uh, the concept of a CBCT for you guys. All right, so she's 18, straight teeth, impacted canine. So here's a regular canine on the right. There's, a, there's a, an upper C, canine's impacted. We see this all the time, all the time. There, is, there isn't a GP that does any of this stuff. It's not that hard. It's, you just need to know what the protocol is as far as, you know, um, where, you know, where is the tooth? Can I get it? Do I need to send it to the oral surgeon to, to um, attach or can I do it myself? If you do it yourself, a, I charge in my office for a single canine like this to attach it, the surgery, and it's very simple, uh, $1,200. I can do it like in 30 minutes, start to finish. Okay, however, um, what we want to do in um, you know, modern times is we want to take a CBCT. So let me show you this. And this will kind of bring it to your attention. Apologize for the lightness of this, this um, uh, pan up. But a patient comes in, right? And you ask yourself, hey, you know, I got two impacted canines. Does this patient need a chrome bin? So I'm looking at this case, this is one of my cases, I'm looking at the case and I'm saying, well, on the right-hand side, I can actually see the outline of that lateral root from start to finish. I can, I can literally see it. 
So I, I'm thinking that this canine is palpably impacted. It hasn't really done any you know, um, damage to the root of the two. Um, but then I go over to the patient's left-hand side and I look and I, right at the mid body of the lateral incisor, I can't see, I can't see the root, I can't see anything. So I say, okay, for sure, we need to find out where these teeth are, what's going on, all right? So I don't have a cone beam, so I have to send them you know, to the lab. So when I get the, the cone beam back, this is what I find. The side that I thought was okay, this side, that canine, this canine, had already burned its way into the pulp chamber of the lateral incisor. The one that I thought was the problem on the left side, okay, didn't have a problem. So the, the issue here is, Oops, sorry about that. The issue here is um, if you started to do this case and you didn't find out where that uh, lateral was and you subsequently did, then it's going to be your fault, right? Because you didn't, you didn't do the due diligence. So just keep that in mind. My opinion, my opinion, um, all impacted canines that are overlapped on another tooth, not the ones that you can see clearly, but the ones that are overlapped, get a comedian. All right, how do, we, how do we bring these things in? Well, we attach to them, right? In this case, they just put a simple bracket. I like a little bonded button. And you have an, a, a wire that you deflect up towards the impaction to bring it in. This is a stabilization wire, so the teeth on either side of the impaction don't pull up while the while the, the impacted tooth is coming in. And you just keep doing that. You just keep doing that until the tooth finally comes in. So this is start, this is four months, hasn't moved much, but within eight months, the tooth has come down. So when you have an impacted canine case, you must add somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to 12 months, you know, somewhere in that neighborhood, maybe six to 12 months. Eventually the tooth will come into position. And then after that, after that, it's a matter of exactly the same mechanics that I've been showing on all of the other cases. So what you did on this case is you took a little detour. You started the case. You realized that that, that had an impacted tooth. Then once, the impa once you, you um, attached the impaction and brought it into the arch, there's a specific treatment plan number 142 for this. It takes you step by step by step how to do it. We will teach you how to do that surgery, by the way. It's not hard. And you go through exactly the same wire progression. Some rubber bands might be needed. Finishing bands you know, would be needed. All four of these cases went with the same you know, litany of, of progression. All right. And final. Okay. So you wouldn't expect the teeth to move much because the only thing that you did in this case was, you know, do some minor alignment and bring in the canine. Right. So this, the start and the final step are going to be the numbers are almost going to be exactly the same. She's a she was a, an adult, so you would not expect growth like those last two cases. The teeth themselves hardly moved. All you did was just align them. Okay. This case, this case right here, okay, very simple case. And if you did the surgery, right, in my office, I, I'm a little bit different. I'm not a PPO, you know, dentist. I'm, I'm either Delta Premier or fee for service. So my, my fees for my ortho are more than what, let's say, a Delta PPO can charge. But even at Delta PPO fees, this very, very simple case right here would be $5,000. Very simple case, which you're, most, most of the time your assistants can do can do. So this is the second to the last slide. I wanted to finish and I don't like to start with, you know, this type of thing because it's not very cool, but I do want to show you because I know that people, dentists are all over the map. In other words, some people that take progressive ortho are just right out of school and they have, like for me, I just basically retired from my office after 38 years. And others, like me and Paul, have been at it for a while, <laughs> right? 
So it depends, but this is just the basics. This is what a GP can be missing if you just don't take that first step and take someone's, you know, ortho course and learn how to do it correctly. You got to learn how to do it correctly. You know, no, no six month smiles, no, you know, fast braces, none of that stuff. That's not the correct way to do it. You know, don't think that you're, that you can do, you know, aligners because you took Invisalign's, you know, three day course. That's not how you do it. What you have to do in order to learn this stuff is you have to take a decent, comprehensive, well thought out program. Okay. Now, this is what you could be missing. What I did over here on the left hand side is I just cases per year, like maybe you do 10 cases, 20, or maybe 50. What that equates to is if you're doing 10 cases per year, you're doing less than one per month. If you're doing 50 cases per year, you're doing about one, one a week. In other words, you're starting one case per week. Even if you're doing it as a hobby, because you will not, you will not see or feel 10, 10 ortho cases in your, in your, your practice. It just won't exist because the amount, the amount of work that you have to do on them is so, so minimal. But even then, at the end of 10 years, you've made an extra half of them. Now, this is at you know, 5,000 per case, which you guys have to kind of dumb it down to 3,800, I think. But, but if you're up to 50, which is not that big of a deal, because orthodontists do hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases per year, a GP can easily do 50, and a GP can easily do one per week. At the end of every year, you just put an extra 250K into your bank account. At the end of 10 years, you put 2.5 mil. So this is not chump change that we're talking about when we start talking about the amount of production value that you have with ortho. Okay? Over on the right-hand side, potential lifetime income. If you're doing 30 cases per year, okay, and you only do it for 10 years, 1.5. But if you're up there at 50 cases, Let's say that you're, you're fresh out of school, you've been out of school two or three years, you start a practice, you begin to do 50 cases per year, which is really not that much, believe me, it's not. One start per week is a couple of hours of your time you know, to, to do. At the end of 30 years, and I practiced for 38, but at the end of 30 years, you put an extra 7.5 million into your 401k. So I, I kind of like to end with this because it, it kind of opens people's eyes just a little bit in terms of, my, it's my opinion that at some point in the near future, not necessarily tomorrow, but every GP should seriously consider, you know, learning this, this subject. And like I said in the very beginning, I don't know what's going to happen in the next these next couple of years, but you know we could be heading into a recession, and it might even be more you know appropriate for us to to do it. Okay, Gabby, Yasin, that's it for me except for the chat, which I will sit here and do. Um, do would you guys like to add anything, or are you going to stick around for the chat? Thanks for coming, everyone. I will now add the link to the chat. Um, fill out the form, and you'll get your CDs that way. Um, and I also wanted to let you know that if you're interested in um, starting your ortho education this year, we have some classes starting. We have hybrid classes and virtual classes. We have a class in Houston that will start next month. Uh, Thank you, Gabby. Thank you for that. <laughs> I forgot that I put, I forgot that I put all this stuff here. Yasin was going to kick me in the the uh, tail. Let me let me let me paraphrase what what Gabby was just about ready to tell you guys. Okay, I put these in here for a purpose, and I I actually forgot. Them. Okay, there's different ways that you can take this this if you are interested at all. There's different ways that you can take. There's the in person classes where you actually go to the seminar site and you sit in the class for 48 days, 12 different, 12 seminars, four days each, 48 days. It's a comprehensive series in-person teaching. That's given at various places. I'll show you a slide in just a second. Then there's one called the IAT hybrid, which is also given in you know, various cities. The IAT is a little bit different in that you don't go to the seminar site as often. 
you only have to go to the seminar site four times, not 12. And you're only going for three days apiece, three days each time rather than four. So your total in-class time in the IAT is 12 days. And it's about three, three months apart, somewhere in there. And the cases, like the cases that I showed you, are presented um, in um, PowerPoint form with all the narrative and the discussion points and everything kind of at the bottom of the page. So you, so you are kind of self-propelled when it comes to looking at the cases. When, when, we're, when we are there for 12 days, we do, we do study cases, but we don't study as many as if you were in person the entire time. That's called the IAT, it's a hybrid type class. Then there's the, the total virtual classroom, okay? So in the virtual classroom, um, what we would do is, and there's gonna be a virtual class that's starting in October, on October, I think 19th, 18th or 19th, it's a Wednesday. And we're gonna meet every Wednesday night for three hours for 30 sessions. Now, when it comes time to doing the hands-on, when it comes time to doing the hands-on, the way that we do it is like this. What I will have is I will have a second webcam and I will, I will, do, I will do anything on my second webcam to show you guys. So if I need to bend a wire, if I need to show you, any, you know, anything, it's gonna be right here on, on my webcam. Then when you are finished doing you know, the exercise, what, whoops, sorry. When you are doing, finished doing the exercise, you simply show me what you did on your webcam. You simply hold it up so that you know, I can see what you did. And we can go back and forth and it can be, it can be a total virtual class you don't have to go um, to the class at all, okay? I mean, literally you take this program either sitting at your desk like I am at my house right now or maybe at your office. Now, what, what um, some people do is called self-paced and that is you're, you're, you're on your own with a mentor. So you, you study all the seminar videos, you're, you, know, you get all of this information, um, you get access to the videos of the in-person classes. So it's like you're there, but you're watching it on video. And then if you have any questions or with cases and the like, you would ask your mentor. Like, let's say I would be your mentor and then we can correspond back and forth. What a lot of people do, and what I kind of suggest, what a lot of what people should do is if you're, if you're interested in starting, then you just start with the self-paced and you get the information and you start watching the videos and you, you get up to speed. And then somewhere there's going to be starting either an in-person class or an IAT hybrid class or even a virtual class. And then what you want to do is join that class. And then you get very specific hands, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, just like we're doing right now. Okay. So these are the learning formats. If you need any extra information on that, just let me know. So there's all kinds of ones that are starting, right? Different, different cities at different times. Gabby would be the one to contact if you're interested in anything, even overseas, because these classes here are just in the United States, but even overseas classes. And then the last thing I will say is um, um, POS is not just ortho. So if you are, if, um, Let's say that you decide to join. You can have a dental assisting course. There's, there's orthodontics for children, a series specifically designed for uh, the kids. There's um, ortho considerations for TMD and you know, migraine. There's you know, a, a very dedicated mechanics class where you learn everything about mechanics. There's even a liner series. So there's a lot of other things that POS has to offer in addition to the, the standards, you know, straight wire series. So now, did I cover it, Gabby? <laughs> I was trying to go yes. a little, trying, trying to go a little faster. Yes. Okay. So now, Gabby, did you want to add anything? Um, um, I think you covered everything that's coming up. Um, I'm sorry, did you, I think you mentioned the aligner classes, right? 
Yes. Yeah. So POS has, if, if people are interested, let's say that you're, that you're not interested in the um, straight wire right now, and you're only in, interested in aligners. POS has a comprehensive aligners class that will teach you um, very, very, very comprehensive uh, aligner uh, treatment. And it doesn't matter if it's Invisalign or um, Clear Correct or Sure Smile or even Angel Line. You can still use all of these techniques because it, it really dives into the, the nuances of um, how to treat people with aligners. So yes, there's aligner classes. And uh, one last thing is we do have a webinar special for seminar one. So anybody interested in starting up, just let Gabby know. Yeah. Um, sorry, Dr. Hura is asking about appliances. Um, yes. Um, so I'll answer that one now because that one just popped up, but I'm going to go through all of the questions that I have over here on the right. But um, the question was, do we teach appliances? The answer is yes, because in the mixed dentition, you have a whole series of um, appliances that you're going to be using depending on the malocclusion. So yes, um, when you get to seminars, um, about seminar number four, five, six, and seven, kind of right there in the middle, um, it's really heavy in the mixed dentition. And what goes along with that is all the different appliances. So yes. And if I didn't answer the question all the way, just you know, let me know, because I'm just going to go down the, the, the list right here as far as the, the questions in the chat. OK, so it, uh, first question that comes up is, what can you say about delta brackets? I heard, I heard cases using those finish in about six months. Um, if somebody tells you that you can go start to finish in six months just because of the bracket, um, they're full of hot air. Um, any case that's very, very uh, simple, right, can be treated very, very quickly. Uh, any case that's very, very complicated, um, so, sometimes it's gonna take time. So, um, no, I mean, it's, it's, are you gonna correct, are you gonna correct, you know, any amount of class two, are you gonna line the case, correct the class two and finish the case in six months? This is impossible. So it's a, it's a marketing ploy um, and a lot of people, that start with the simpler classes, like let's say six month smiles and fast braces and you know, different you know, speed, speed braces stuff. Um, you can straighten teeth, you learn how to put a bracket on, um, you can take very simple cases and make them look better. It's not that you can't do it, it's just that once you get to that level where you want to start doing a lot of comprehensive ortho, then those systems tend to really fall apart because they don't have the, the mechanics that are associated with them, basically all they are is just alignment of the cases. And sometimes that's all the, the person wants, you know, but no, you can't, you can't consistently finish a case in six months. And in fact, there's, a, there's kind of an unwritten rule in ortho. One of the, the issues in ortho that we all deal with is retention. So you finish the case and the teeth look really nice and you give the patient some type of retainer then, then, you know, what, what does the, the case look like in a year? What does the case look like in two years? What does the case look like in 10 years retention? Well, if you do a case, if you do a, a speed case, start to finish six months, take them off. The retention is not as good because the teeth haven't had time to, you know, be in that position uh, long enough. So the patient has to be a super good retainer wear. I mean, really, really good. Otherwise you tend to get a little bit of relapse. Uh, the other one, I'm not clear with crossbite versus scissor bites. Could you tell me one more time? Basically, basically it's the same thing. If you do an anterior, um, oftentimes I'll call it a scissor bite, but it's basically just a crossbite. So the, those two are kind of interchangeable. Mostly in the posterior, you'll say um, either a bilateral or a unilateral, bilateral or a unilateral crossbite. And if it's in the anterior, if you have just like one lateral incisor that's behind all the other teeth, so all of your incisors are correct except that one lateral is back, that's kind of, um, the term for that is kind of like a scissor, right? Because you just have one that's, that's in um, bad position. But they're, in, they're interchangeable. Oh, Je Jeff Taylor. Mm, cross mine, okay. 
Okay, so he got really technically technical on me. He says crossbite is when the upper is smaller than normal. Scissor bite is when the upper is larger than normal. Scissor bite is often called a telescopic bite since the upper can completely go over the lower. Okay, so that's kind of more of a technical, you know, term, but for the most part, they're kind of interchangeable. Okay. Um, Jeff also said the vast majority of cross bites are skeletal in nature, so the short answer is yes. Okay. Okay. Dr. Chabra, clinically, what do you see? I mean, teeth. In the first case, I could see crossbite in the teeth in the incisors. How did you see? Okay, we're getting into that, that scissor bite. Um, how do you attach wire coils? So I think you're talking about nitai coils. Um, the nitai coils in the posterior, there's a little hook on the molar band, and the molar, the molar band. Um, you, you attach the, the, the end of the coil just onto that hook. And in the anterior, all you do is you put a little ligature tie and you tie it around the loop in the arch wire and you stretch it to a certain force. So the way that you attach the coils in the back is to the hook that's on the molar band. And in the front, you use a ligature tie to stretch it to a certain amount uh, to give you a certain force. Yeah, Paul used ligature wire to connect the coils. I'm going to search. Okay. So Gabby says, please fill out the form. So there's a link to the form there. Make sure that you guys get your seat. If you don't, for some reason, just contact me and I'll make sure, Gabby will make sure it's not a big deal. Once again, does people offer information about appliances? Yeah, we go over appliances. Um, you have to when you start talking about uh, certain types of growth management and mixed dentition. So yes. And then Gabby says, feel free, feel free to call or text. And she's got her number there. All right, so that was quite a few less answers or less questions than I thought. Does anybody have any you know, final um, questions that they would like to ask or maybe place in the chat on your message? Yeah, you're welcome. Paul says, thanks. Any other, you guys can unmute yourself and just ask the question verbally if you'd like. No? Okay, well, it was supposed to be an hour and a half plus questions. I guess it's not too bad. We went over about 20, 20 minutes or so. Um, hey, Gabby, can you put my um, email address um, and send it to everybody? Yes. Okay. The so Gabby, the Gabby was, <laughs> go ahead. The, the Gmail or the SBC Global? A uh, Gmail. Okay. So Gabby's gonna give you my email um, address. If you have any questions on any of this stuff, I know I went over really fast. I, I skipped a lot of stuff, you know, as far as the technical details and the little nuances. I just kind of wanted to show um, you just kind of a wide range of different things so that you can get an idea and maybe ask some questions like you did. And um, now, hopefully, you know, you guys will start thinking about, you know, taking that next step and um, you know, joining. So me personally, um, I'm gonna be starting a virtual class in about, let's see, it's August, September, October, in about six weeks. And it seems to be going over really well with people because um, you don't have to travel. You can actually just watch, you know, we can interact just like we're doing right now, um, once a week with, um, in, a, in a virtual class. So that's going to be starting, I believe it's it's October 19th, Wednesday, I think so. Justine's giving me a thumbs up, I think. Um, so if you're interested in that or interested in anything else that you saw or any questions, if I can't answer them, I'll get you, I'll give you to someone that can. All right. So I would like to thank everybody for attending. And um, hopefully I will see your friendly faces in one of the uh, classes, upcoming classes. Hopefully, okay.
All right. Thank you, guys. See you later.